and welcome back everyone to another teaching and learning video. So today we're going to talk about the fact that artificial intelligence has the potential to revolutionize the way we teach and learn, but its integration into the education sector is not without challenges. From ethics and bias to lack of standardization, AI in education is faced with a number of obstacles that must be addressed before its full potential can be realized. In this video, we'll explore the current challenges and discuss the potential solutions to help pave the way for a successful future for AI in education. Okay, and I'm gonna to be totally honest with you, I did not write that. So this was a prompt that I put in today into ChatGPT, which I'm going to encourage you throughout this video series on AI and education. And this is these are actually my thoughts right now, not the thoughts of um, a computer. But um, throughout this series, I want you to really go in and try the tools that I'm talking about. And really in this series, there's gonna be two goals. We're gonna look at conceptual issues, the high level issues, almost akin to like talking about ethics and medicine. When new medical technologies and scientific technologies came out like cloning, or stem cell research, all the many issues out there that we know in today's modern medical and technological worlds, bioethics came up, medical ethics came up to um, really address the concerns that people had, mainly to the question, if we have the technology, should we use it? Is it ethical to use it? And these debates still rage on. In fact, going back to Shelley's great novel, Frankenstein, uh, that was memorialized in, in future movies, but nonetheless written in 1818, uh, you see these same themes. You could even go back to Plato's cave, um, what he predicted in terms of this world of simulation and virtual reality, and see that these are not really new issues, yet we sometimes think, because of that sort of bias of having blinders to time, only seeing maybe the moment we're in, we assume that what is happening now with AI and education is entirely new, unique, and perhaps in a fatalistic sense, impossible to recover from or impossible to adapt to. What I wanna do in this video series on AI and education, which I believe will be like in three parts, is to really cover all the issues out there to engage in some conversations that range from the nitty gritty practical to how do we use a tool like chat GPT that you see on the screen here to teach our students new things, to teach ourselves new things, to maybe take some opportunities to learn something new from a machine that has synthesized close to 200 billion different points of information or text or language or communication. At the same time, we want to be wary, right? We want to say, what happens if I give a prompt to my student in the class? And by the way, what prompted this series and my recent posts, if you got a chance to see this on my blog, um, I'm constantly doing new updates. So I recently, on February 1st, posted AI in Education Opening Conversation. I laid out kind of the initial issues. I gave you kind of a, a sample of some early things I put into the chat GPT engine, and we'll get to what that is in a second, including a um, fictional address by President Jeff DeFranco that it created, and also a prompt that I created to teach a concept in a cultural anthropology class. I also gave you five examples of current AI detectors that may or may not be that great in terms of detecting some of this stuff. One of the concerns I had this week when I heard from two faculty about potential plagiarized or AI generated content is how the heck do we get ahead of this? And some people are saying, and I'll show you in this series quite a few articles and sources, that you maybe can't get fully ahead of it, but you can adapt and prepare yourself. So conversations we might have at LTCC might include things like, how do we understand what tools are out there? How do we revise how we think about classroom assignments? Maybe for some of you, if you teach an in-person class, you'll do more in-person writing in your classroom. And thus there wouldn't be the potential to throw things into a machine uh, generated language program that will just spit out information for a student essay. For those of you that teach online, you might say, I'm gonna really focus as I should suggest here in my blog post on writing very specific prompts to writing assignments. If you say something general, like I might in cultural anthropology and say, why is cultural relativism studied in anthropology or discussed? That's really generic and general and probably will easily be generated inside of chat GPT. And in fact, I know it will because my uh, assignment that I tested out came up and it was amazing. Let me tell you, the assignment 
that chat GPT created for cultural relativism here is something I could totally use. Again, to go back to my prompt that I wrote here or that I, I wrote for the computer, uh, it came up with this. And, you know, the funny thing is, I again, I didn't put anything in here. It's collecting all this data and information. And chat GPT, by the way, is also known as chat generative pre-trained transformer. It's so hard to say and remember, I actually had to write it down, but it kind of makes sense when you get into what chat GPT is. So generative means this idea that it can generate all kinds of information. I could go in here right now, super crazy, and I could say, please, um, let's just try this for the heck of it. Write me a song. Uh, let's call it a country song about um, the value of a Lake Tahoe Community College education. By the way, you know, at this point, if you ever... Um, get stuck and chat GPT doesn't generate your response. I'll show you. I can show you this in a second if it happens. You just have to refresh the entire browser. If you click new chat, sometimes it still won't do it. I think it's just like a lot of strain on the system. Uh, indeed, it's working. So here we go. Now, now, this is crazy. Again, I didn't put anything in except please write me a country song about the value of a Lake Tahoe Community College education. And um, what's amazing is some things here. And again, I'm just looking at this in real time with you. It knows it's a mountain town. Um, yeah, I'm looking for specific things, hands-on experience, world-class degree. It Does it actually know based on like reading about our college that that's the case, or is it just assuming? So it's always like one of these things I'm wondering, like in that example of the President DeFranco speech, did it actually look up stuff about him? Um, it had to at least know he was at Lake Tahoe Community College, but what about some of the specifics? Um, stuff like this on the bridge, the future's so bright with opportunities galore, and I know that'll make a difference, that's for sure. Some of these are kind of funny. I've actually thrown a couple of these in there, and I've thought of using these for lyrics for songs because they're that good. I mean, some of these are not great. Um, here's the chorus, Lake Tahoe Community College, where I found my way with knowledge and support every day. The value of a good ed education it shines like the sun. In this little corner of the world, it's second to none. That's actually kind of good. I've noticed that chat gpt does a lot of rhyming like in poetry and lyrics i tried out a few songs and by the way you can look around and see exactly what chat gpt um, can generate um, i had a sample here somewhere of the different forms but it's absolutely amazing in terms of um, what you can do uh well, here it is here's that link this just shows you uh, grammar correction q a summarize for a second grader classification movie to emoji um, and ex explain a code. It can actually write, um, as you can see, it, it'll fix bugs in Python, the computer language. Um, you, it can do stuff for you, like create a list of items on a topic. So, you know, the thing about it is it's actually super useful. It's something I'm going to use in my everyday life. And the question for you in education might be, would you use this to automate some things that maybe you don't want to do from scratch? As an example, and again, I'm going to throw this out here in a very agnostic sense. Agnostic meaning that I'm not saying it's good or bad. Um, in fact, going back to a famous technologist, a guy I studied back in my early days as a first year cultural anthropology student, we read this guy and he just kind of transformed how I thought about technology. His name is Dennis Goulet, and he's a developmental thinker, and he focused specifically on the idea that technology is a two-edged sword. It creates and it destroys. And that is the perspective I'll be taking throughout this video series because I really don't want to presume that my opinions on this technology are going to be the same for you. My uses of these AI technologies are going to be the same as for you. So that's really important to me. I'm not going to be like, you know, condemning it. I'm going to be critical, but I'm also going to be positive in places. So here's an example, and we're kind of jumping into this and we'll talk about some concepts. Here's an example of maybe you're sitting down one day in your office and you have to write a memo. Um, what's something that we would write a memo about? Let's see here. I'm going to try to think of something super, super specific. Okay. Um, I'm not on the Guided Pathways work team, but let's see. Let's say write a short memo that expresses the value of Guided Pathways you know, and I'm not going to write in here, like, I'm not going to give it too many hints. I'm going to see, does it know what the heck Guided Pathways is? That expresses the value of Guided Pathways in a community college education. 
I have no idea what it's going to produce. You know, and to me, part of the fun here is it's kind of like the black box. It's kind of like the magic eight ball that you shake and it says, try again next time or something like that. But in this case, it's using not eight or 10 or 12 random elements and words um, or like a Ouija board that, you know, presumably doesn't have a real uh, connection to information in the world. But this is using all the information that it's gleaned from the world. And in fact, if you look up AI, some things that kind of stand out is that AI, in, in a sense, can perceive, it can synthesize, it can infer, and maybe even it has memory. In fact, some folks are saying, imagine if this, this gets really good, then you could type in some stuff and it could be like a virtual therapist. It's almost like those chat bots that we use when we want to help, which are pretty freaking annoying. Sometimes you go online and it's like, hi, I'm so-and-so, may I help you? And after a little bit of time, you begin to realize like, oh, I'm not talking to a real person. Um, same thing with um, little chat bots that are part of voice operated systems on the phone. You're like, I want to talk to a human. And um, there's jokes about how you can't often talk to a human if you're trying to dial in or, or go onto one of these uh, store sites to get a return going or something. But let's try this out. Let's see, is it going to get a good, let me just copy it to make sure um, I have it. Let's see. So write a short memo expressing the value of a guided pathways um, of guided pathways in a community college education. And it's kind of um, taking some time to work here. I've noticed sometimes if chat GPT is really loaded in terms of a lot of traffic, it's it's super slow. I could actually try, let me just take what I've cut and pasted. And if this happens to you, you could click new chat. Sometimes I found though it still doesn't refresh it. So I start at the top of my browser. I just hit return. And then it, it usually works. Let's try it one more time. And it could just be it's crowded and we'll have to come back in a second. Um, okay, only one at a time. Okay, it thinks I guess I'm doing more than one. So maybe it doesn't like that. Okay, we're just going to wait and give it a second here to process. Aha, here we go. It even writes a thing in a memo format. To all stakeholders, the importance of subject, the importance of guided pathways in community college education. Community college education has always been a crucial part of the American educational system, providing access to quality education. See, you know, starting off that that writing, frankly, like I would probably wouldn't write a memo like that because if I'm sending a memo to my colleagues here, that first sentence is like kind of etched in your consciousness. Everybody knows that. So this shows you maybe some of the stylistic problems with this kind of tool. Now, the second sentence gets more to maybe what I'd be looking for. Guided pathways have recently emerged as a transformative approach in community college colleges, offering a clear and structural roadmap for students to reach their educational and career goals. Guided pathways offer several key benefits for students, including these are kind of what, you know, we might think about as the values of guided pathways, student outcomes, efficiency, support, accessibility. And then it ends in conclusion, guided pathways have a tremendous potential to transform community college education and ensure that all students have access to the support and resources they need to succeed. I encourage all stakeholders to embrace this approach and work together to support its implementation and success. Best regards, your name. And they'll typically do this. So like if you wanna use this to write a recommendation letter or to write something like a memo, it will often have replace text areas. The other thing you should note is when you're using chat GPT, it's gonna save all your conversations until you hit clear conversations here on the side. And the reason for that is this is really like a conversation with a bot or remember those old games like Zork, I'm dating myself here, but Zork was, you would type in text stuff, but it was very limited. Like um, Zork didn't have a lot of abilities to be gener generative and also uh, pre-trained. One of the things that goes on with ChatGPT is, is when the program, if you will, the, the robot, whatever you want to call it, create something trainers, human trainers will actually go in and adjust things and tell it to correct itself, give it rewards and so forth. And that's kind of the scary thing, I guess, about this technology. It maybe reminds us of Stephen Hawking's concern that we have to worry way more about intelligent machines, machines that have the ability to think um, as opposed to maybe an alien invasion. So people have really warned us, and I don't think we're that far off. I just personally think that Seeing what transformative stuff has happened when ChatGPT was launched here in beta, at least in November, just in 2022, 
all the the conversations and concerns. Anderson Cooper recently did a feature. So everybody is talking about this and we know it's hitting us right now in education and thus our concerns are maybe uh, there and, and we have some some questions and conversations to have about how to use this. So what I'm saying is you can actually go through this. You can regenerate a response. You could actually go in and say, um, please adapt this to a different focus and it will change it for you. So all of your conversations are saved here and then you can go back and actually look stuff up and change it. And you could see some of my um, uh, <laughs> interesting stuff. Like I, I wanted to write a pop song about onions. So, I mean, it's just really uh, just about anything you, you can imagine here. So um, I'm pretty blown away by this. And we've started off kind of with the practical, not the conceptual. But if you're seeing what I'm doing here, you might be having that kind of moment where you say like, wow, this is really potentially crazy. Like this is useful because I would love like if I were writing a memo, let's say, to my local homeowners association, and I had certain topics, um, and I could do this. I could say, um, please write a memo, and you want to do it. I'm just going to put HOA to my HOA. I hope it knows that's homeowners association. That is a complaint about the bad snow removal this winter. It's actually something I've, I've thought about. <laughs> We've had some, some hard winters uh and this is one of the, the bigger ones I remember. So let's see what it does with this prompt because this is super practical and something that I could actually use maybe. Okay, so I think it's getting here. Yes, it does. Look at this. It has the memo to board of directors, HOA name, subject complaint about inadequate snow removal this winter. I hope this memo finds you well. Hey, it's nice that chat GPT is trying to be uh, nice up front and not telling uh, the HOA off. I'm writing to express my concerns about the recent snow removal efforts in our community this winter. Despite the repeated snowfalls and freezing temperatures, sidewalks and roads have not been cleared adequately, making it a difficult and dangerous or making it difficult and dangerous for residents to navigate the community. This is pretty darn amazing. And then look at this paragraph here. I understand snow removal can be a challenging ta task. It's imperative that our community is equipped to handle it efficiently and effectively. As homeowners, we pay a significant amount in HOA fees. What's amazing about that sentence there is it knows. So I put in HOA and it knows like the issues associated with it. It's almost like, and I don't know how it does it like inside of a computer, but this, this stuff is, is, I would say mega freaky. So imagine it has a term. I'm just going to do this. I don't have my board, but um, so it knows the term HOA, right? And first off, it knows that it's a homeowner's association. And you might say, okay, that's an easy operation. That is uh, an acronym. And we can put into a computer, you can do this in Excel, right? That this HOA, that acronym, those three letters means homeowner's association. What's pretty remarkable here is what else it knows. So it also knows that HOAs pay significant funds. And notice it didn't state like, in my community, if it's $53, it didn't state that because obviously it's going to depend. And you could go in, and one of the points I'll make on this is you can go in and edit. Like if you're doing a letter of recommendation or a lesson plan, this could be your skeleton outline that it generates for you. And then you go in and you make some adaptations. I think that makes a lot of sense. I sometimes do that with media or music projects. I might take a sample that I take from the environment or a sound of a bulldozer and then I take that and run that through my various devices, and then I uh, have something new. So we, we kind of do this in, in some senses in terms of how we remake stuff. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And then it also knows that a board of directors takes action. You know, you say like, well, that is kind of obvious. But yeah, to a machine, it's obvious to us. But the machine knows that the board of directors takes action. So what's crazy about this is for any term, concept, meme, bit of information that it has... It's making like semantic connections, connections of meaning, associations. And the challenge, I think, will be to see how sophisticated this can get. And I think it's already there. So this is pretty crazy because it has the form of a memo. Again, you would just put the stuff in here. And it really knows other things beyond HOAs. It knows that snow removal is important. It's about safety and reputation and appearance of our community. Again, that's pretty crazy. So there are other things it knows that if there's an, it's, it's sort of like those if-then operations in computing or in logic. So 
If HOA, then we know that part of having a HOA, which is probably controversial, stuff like reputation of the community. So again, this is highly sophisticated in terms of what it can figure out. And one of the great things about this, when we call it generative and uh, transformative, what's going on then is the model, the algorithms, the brain, if you will, inside the machine is figuring out what word might come next. So if you think about something like a memo, um, you would have something like a to and a subject, and then it knows to start off with, I hope this memo finds you well. So something that's uh, conversational that some of us might actually write. So unlike that last prompt, which I thought was a little, I don't know, awkward because it starts off with something too general that I, the audience would know, this one is really on point. Like it says, hey, hope you're doing okay. I'm mad at you, but I'm not going to say that. And then I'm expressing my concerns. And it's like, again, some of the language here is is nicer than what you maybe would expect if, if you wrote it and you're really concerned about this. So I'm just kind of amazed at this. And again, if you start to really deconstruct and look at what this is doing, um, you know, there's a reason that people are blown away by this current technology because it is absolutely amazing in terms of what it's able to do. So we're kind of just playing around here again in the world here of chat GPT. And you could use this as um, people have even said with the memory capabilities of saving conversations, saving chats as we do here. Imagine over time, if you had a rough day at work, you could talk to it and it could become kind of a virtual therapist. It reminds me of episodes of Black Mirror. It reminds me of that old Spielberg movie that he took over for uh, Kubrick uh, AI uh, with Haley Joel Osment that was um, like a, a little sentimental, but I thought kind of interesting, like asking, should robots or sentient beings that are not carbon-based, that are like maybe the Cylons on Battlestar Galactica, should they have rights? Um, just like people are asking for animals, um, people who are animal activists. So it raises, I think, a lot of uh, interesting questions about the ethics, about the uh, degrees to which this is going to tr transform our lives and really cause us to uh, maybe alter how we approach our jobs in our case here in in the world of education. So maybe to go back a little bit and we'll get into the conceptual and historical here, it's fun to look at, in this case, chat GPT and do some fun examples. By the way, go to uh, the website for OpenAI. We're also going to look at Dolly, which is the program that allows you to do um, image uh, generations, that allows you to go in and create images. Actually, this is one I did recently, and it's kind of horrible. It says, create an image of Lake Tahoe Community College in a cyberpunk style. So I could actually remove that and just say, create an image of Lake Tahoe Community College. So this is Dolly, and this is owned by OpenAI. OpenAI is a firm in the Bay Area. I believe they started in 2015, if I'm not incorrect. Because of ChatGPT, their current valuation is at $29 billion, so pretty major. Um, I think Microsoft has invested money in ChatGPT, and um, eventually I heard, I don't know how soon, that that program, that tool will be inside of all the Microsoft suite. So before you probably know it, you'll open up PowerPoint, you'll open up Microsoft Word, Excel even, and there'll be stuff in there that you can use immediately to kickstart your memo or to start your Excel spreadsheet. Um, I mean, there are currently programs out there that will, for example, take human everyday language and transform that into um, a sheet or an equation inside of Microsoft Excel. So some of this is not new per se, but eventually we're gonna see that inside of the entire Office suite. Um, actually, this <laughs> this is pretty horrible. So create an image of Lake Tahoe Community College and. Uh, how many of you are going to run out? I don't think our marketing department is going to use that. Actually, this isn't terrible. I mean, there at least is the lake, but what the heck is that here? Um, a lot of these images that I've noticed, it'll throw in weird, funky. <laughs> it's just it's so bizarre. Like, what the heck is this? It's like a bullseye, and there's like a a, a vomit thing in the middle. I don't know. And it says Tang Oe Kane. I don't know what that even says. And then this one. Again, we're not on the lake, but um, it says something that looks like cloud in it. So these are kind of bad. And um, yeah, you know, you're not going to probably use these anytime soon. I mean, they're kind of funny and entertaining. Um, but what we saw with ChatGPT, the text version of OpenAI, is totally, totally remarkable. So 
I think one of the curious things about this is what will the uses be? And if you had a chance to look at my uh, technology grant, the workshop I did, I really got into some of the social issues related to technology in our lives. And that's really, as a cultural anthropologist, where I see some of this heading is terms of just like bioethics, questions, conversations, debates, legislation about this stuff. Imagine if in the future with self-driving cars, which is an example of AI, there are concerns or issues there and we have to pass ordinances to protect people for, uh, from safety issues related to that kind of machine-driven, literally, technology. Um, imagine if this content that we're working with with chat GPT or we start getting into photorealism and images, that starts to proliferate, proliferate social media, which it already is, or we get into issues of you know, bots that create legislation for us. Do we really want that? Do we want our legislature uh, out there, whatever body that is, creating stuff using a bot? Now, some of us might say, well, I really don't care to write that letter to my HOA, so instead I could do this and go in and edit it. It's going to take me much less time. I kind of concur with that. Again, I'm trying to look at the pros and cons, and I have to say I've already used this to kickstart some things myself. So like I would never use it personally to write an article. I would never use it maybe to do something that I was paid for and I felt that it violated like a professional ethical code. Now, if I'm writing a song and I can't think of a lyric or I can't rhyme something, if I want my lyric to rhyme, I might actually use this. In fact, there's a lyric I created recently for a song I'm doing on consumer um, culture. And I thought, I think I'm going to use it because it's kind of good. Um, and, it, and it's kind of crazy. And so I really, again, am challenging us to think outside the box on this and not assume, well, it's all bad because it's computer generated or it raises concerns like those of Frankenstein back in the day. Now, so I mentioned that Dolly is the same company, OpenAI, based in the Bay Area, valued at over $29 billion. And I think one of the cool things that OpenAI has figured out is that there's a real value to doing stuff like this. Imagine if you can create an image that has never existed before. In fact, um, people have done this. Create an image of, I'm going to look up his name, the great director Jodorowsky. I just want to get his full name, Alejandro Jodorowsky, Chilean, French, avant-garde filmmaker. People have done this. I haven't had a chance to try it yet. Create an image of... Um, Star Wars, if directed by Alejandro Jodorowsky. And in fact, he I, if you saw that film, Jodorowsky's Dune, it's, it's really remarkable. Like he originally was going to make the film Dune and uh, that didn't happen. So this is an example of something that never existed yet will be created. And what's really funky and crazy about this AI stuff like Dolly is that Typically, you know, you won't see the same thing ever again. Like, I will never see these images ever again. You think about the infinitesimal combinations of colors and imagery and backgrounds and foregrounds and all this stuff. You're talking about things that are unique and will never exist ever again. So let's see what, what happens here if we try this, just kind of for fun. It's very quick, and you can see this. This is an oil painting by Matisse of a humanoid um, robot playing chess. That could be a great teaching tool. Imagine if you use Dolly right now in one of your art history classes or a class like in visual anthropology that I teach. Think about how cool it would be to do analysis of images that are created on the fly and never have been seen by anyone on the planet. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable as you're seeing in some of these examples here. So let's see what it comes up with here in our image. It's taking a little bit of time here, but I think it'll hopefully be worth the wait. Armchair in the shape of an avocado. I love the samples. And one of the things that's kind of interesting, if you've seen some of my other videos I've done on AI and images, um, is really the prompts. And in fact, people are getting into the business of where they sell you prompts that are going to be the best prompts to put in an AI generator. And I think that's kind of crazy, but it shows you that the specificity and what you write in your prompt, whether it's Dolly or ChatGPT, is really going to affect the output of what happens when the machine spits out the images or the text or whatever it is that you're trying to generate. A bowl of soup that's a portal to another dimension, digital art. So what often happens here is if you put like at the end of your image surrealism or cubism, filevism, whatever, it will actually go in and create it in that style. You could even put um, you know, a stained glass window, this is a cool one depicting a robot, and you could put in a stained glass window 
in the style of James Cameron's Avatar, the colors and lux and the fluidity in the water and all that stuff. So Synthwave. So um, I've seen some really good guides that get into using prompts to totally determine what the output will be. And, and this is great. I mean, you look at some of these and they're absolutely stunning and amazing. So again, I think a lot of the time I've worked at least more now with Dolly and some of the image generators, I've been blown away and actually awed at what I see in terms of the creations. Okay, so it is done processing and you see it gave us four images. Um, whether or not that accurately reflects um, the work of Yodorowsky, you could you could kind of look at these images. I mean, I don't know uh, per se, but they're definitely curious and interesting. I mean, one of the things that, that comes up here, I think eventually with more of the synthesis that happens over time is the issue of copyright and people's legal rights to things that are created by an artificial intelligence program. Um, you definitely have this for song generation where you can go in and actually uh, create a song that sounds like Elvis sang it. Well, if you don't hold the rights to his catalog or even his likeness or the his type of voice and how he sings, you know, does that raise issues in terms of intellectual property rights and copyright? I'm sure it does. And that'll be for lawyers out there to figure out. But it just really reminds us of the fact that we're in kind of a new territory, as much as I said at the beginning of this video, this isn't truly new, but yet there is a newness of this and we're kind of worried. I think we're kind of saying to ourselves, well, wait a second, what happens if I have a student in a class and they learn about chat GPT? And in fact, I've even talked to a few faculty on campus saying like, do we tell students about it or not? And I'm pretty sure that eventually chat GPT will make its way into TikTok or to other social media platforms where our students are using it. In fact, some of the new AI uh, technologies that you can use to create avatars of yourself, it's super crazy. Like I could take a picture of myself and do a Western version. I could do an, um, a version of like Star Wars or science fiction. It'll actually use artificial intelligence to take your likeness, alter it in some ways, and then give you a series of styles and choices. And imagine what the world will be like when this happens with video. And in fact, people are very worried about the technology of deep fakes of people, bad actors using fake images to start riots or to start, um, uh, you know, things happening in the world, um, as we saw maybe with uh, the use of social media and that uh, psychology quiz that became a determinant in, in quite a few elections, at least. Reminds me a little bit of the filmmaker Fritz Long, his 1927 film, Metropolis. Um, there's a mad scientist in the film, Rotwang, and he creates this version of this character, Maria, that some have called False Maria. And some say it's the first maybe version of bad AI or evil AI in a film because this Maria is an imposter and then tries to get workers to do something to kind of quell a rebellion. And so you think about how bad actors could use some of this technology, whether it's a deep fake or whether it's some document um, like using to, to cheat in, in a class, or I'm thinking right now of that uh, maniacal guy, George Santos, the um, Republican um, representative recently elected in upstate New York, and uh, just the lies and disinformation and horrible things he said and done. Uh, hopefully the guy resigns and, and is prosecuted for perhaps election fraud, but uh, talk about someone who has no honesty and sense of authenticity. That's what I worry about with this. It's not so much like someone will cheat, but someone will in their minds not go through the process and say, hey, you know what? Instead of taking a shortcut for my class paper, I uh, I need to write it from scratch and I don't want to use chat GPT. Now, I just said earlier, it seems contradictory, maybe, you know, you could use it to write something useful, including a student could use it to write a letter or a memo or something like that. I think the difference is determined by your policies in your class. So throughout our conversations about AI and education, we want to talk about the level of policy, go through our plagiarism policy, and maybe we'll look at that in part um, three, perhaps, in transformation and adaptation, and talk about how we can indeed adapt our plagiarism policy for these new times of AI in education. Artificial intelligence has revolutionized the way we live and work, and education is no exception. By incorporating AI into their teaching practices, faculty at Lake Tahoe Community College can take advantage of cutting edge technology to create more effective and efficient learning environments. All right, that video I just had playing is this new AI tool called Synthesia. And um, I don't know about you, but it's 
you know, on the one hand, kind of fascinating, on the other hand, slightly disturbing. I don't know. There's just something about these AI bots that I find strange at some level. Maybe it's that uncanny value that we've been talking about with robots. So this is entirely generated by a computer. So this is not a real person. And all I did was I put the text in and she spoke it. And this section will actually close out with another uh, one of these bots talking. And so I think for me, as we think about authenticity, you know, there are some really uh, key issues to kind of um, unpack and think about. And actually, one great reference in this regard is the work of the preeminent philosopher Walter Benjamin. And one of his most significant works is that in the work of art in the age of its mechanical reproducibility, as it's called in some translations. And what Benjamin was interested in in this essay was the fact that over time, the aura of art, the fact that art in the old days, let's say, had an association with a place of worship, a temple, um, a statue that was in a significant church or synagogue or mosque. And over time, as reproduction came into being, such as photography, in today's day and age, we can think about all the stuff with virtual reality that we're experiencing. Benjamin's concern was that the aura of the work of art over time was lost. And as it talks about here, this notion of uniqueness and authenticity is really key. And as he says in the essay, the sphere of artistic authenticity is outside the technical sphere of mechanized reproduction. And so it's very interesting that we get into this new age of reproduction. We have questions about authenticity. We're talking about deep fakes. And it could just be we're living in a new time. And so to update our notions of authenticity, maybe we just have to think that authenticity could include something like using a virtual bot or participating in a themed experience in a theme park that has virtual reality components and maybe simulates being in other places or times or other cultures, whatever. Perhaps our notion of authenticity has to undergo revision along with the technology. And I think that goes back to that point earlier about um, biomedical ethics and thinking about the technology and how to appropriately use it to go back to the two-edged nature of technology as opposed to saying it's either you know good or it's bad kind of thing. And that's why I've been trying to take that real um, agnostic view throughout this conversation we're having here in this video series on virtual reality. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention here as I was just going through my phone and, you know, there's just such awareness. This is my news feed and it's just showing you some of the topics that are coming out in terms of people having conversations about open AI. One of the stories here that was just fascinating to me was a judge who actually, I believe in Brazil, wrote a decision, sorry, Colombia, wrote a decision and use chat GPT to um, write this decision. And again, people are saying like, well, is that a good thing? And maybe we don't want a computer program writing something so significant that is impacting the lives of people, say in court cases. AI is coming into uh, spots like Netflix. Netflix released some new uh, videos that actually used AI generated art. So I think these kind of conversations we're having now are really significant. Again, if you go to your phone, you can click on Apple News and you'll find feeds that you can create on technology and AI. And literally every single day, this one is saying someone actually used chat GPT or a chat bot to break up with someone. So we would probably want to say like, you know, some of these uses we would really want to caution against because they may actually get in the way of things like authenticity or meaningful conversation or meaningful communication with one another. So that's why I think personally, it's very important to define for our institution, for our classrooms, for our workspaces at LTCC, exactly how artificial intelligence might be used in some great ways. We'll talk a little bit more in part two and part three of this video in terms of thinking about what are some of the social concerns that we have? Like for example, I always think of the story in India where there used to be people who were personalized writers of letters. Someone would dictate to another person a letter they wanted to send to a loved one, a relative across the country. And these people were professional letter writers. And over time with social media, we started to see that career dwindle, if not disappear. And so 
I think the same conversation needs to be had about technology today for folks in marketing, for folks doing branding work in the corporate um, sectors. What happens if chat GPD could make your job irrelevant, just like robots made some auto worker jobs in the U.S. irrelevant if you saw the Michael Moore film, Roger and Me, and so forth. So I think these kinds of conversations have relevance to us in education. So I would definitely recommend that we have to stay apprised of exactly what people are talking about in all these social spheres if you read media. And again, just showing you kind of the significance of what's happened with AI. You know, the, the, the minute it enters pop culture, I think a lot of us notice, and this is again that cosmopolitan cover that I talked about, at least in my blog post about AI, and it's the kind of the very first, it took 20 seconds to make. So this shows you the power of where we're at. And in this first video, we've talked a lot about AI imagery. I find it personally fascinating. And I have to say, like, that's an amazing cover. Objectively, I think that's really amazing. And, uh, you know, it does raise questions about will it make some, you know, art designers and artist jobs irrelevant, if not no longer necessary, um, if, if this kind of technology continues to take on. And by the way, one of the cool tools out there that you can use is called Futurepedia. I'll talk about this in another video as well, but it's the biggest AI tool directory out there, updated daily, and has over 800 different tools that you can use everything from graphic design to storytelling to, uh, of course, things like coding with Wolfram Alpha, mid-journey, more AI stuff, chat GPT, as we've talked about extensively. And uh, it's absolutely amazing. And you see, you could just scroll and scroll all day long. And uh, any sector that you work in, in education, whatever your job is, you're going to find at current uh, level 854 tools. So that's pretty cool. So one of the tools I discovered recently, I want to kind of balance, you know, that creepiness of the bot talking about LTCC and AI. And I want to suggest, you know, there are some great tools out there that can absolutely save us time and do some things we couldn't do normally. So this is Adobe Podcast, and this is using AI to remove noise um, and uh, different maybe imperfections in your audio recordings. And I use this recently, and it's absolutely amazing. So check this out. This is just my timeline of the recording I'm doing here that you're watching. And I'll first play my original audio for you, and then I'll play the enhanced audio. And I think you're going to notice the difference here of um, AI education and uh, kind of the first topic here and whether or not it's a threat or if it's possibly. So that's the original audio recorded in my office, but there's some hum from um, electrical. Uh, there's a lot of machinery behind my office wall. So now this is the enhanced using the Adobe product that has AI built in. To uh, new forms of learning in our classrooms such that we're actually using in a positive sense. So I, for some time, have been involved in electronic music. And so I think that you can tell in that uh, second case, um, it's better audio. So AI is absolutely transforming sound design and people that do sound design. Um, I have a friend in film who was telling me that he uses this AI program that if he's literally in front of a train track recording dialogue and you think the dialogue is ruined for a movie, this AI technology will actually strip out the sound of the trains. So I'm not going to knock the fact that it can totally revol revolutionize some of the work that we're currently doing. So definitely some stuff to uh, be thinking about. So uh, to close, I'll give you one more bot recording here, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, issues of authenticity and, and getting into uh, topics of control and lacking control in the worlds of technology. As we think about AI at LTCC, Let's be sure that we consider all of the technological, ethical, and practical implications for work and teaching. So I was recently thinking about sort of this issue of um, AI education and uh, kind of the first topic here and whether or not it's a threat or if it's possibly um, something new that can help us and even uh, maybe lead to uh, new forms of learning in our classrooms such that we're actually using in a positive sense. So I, for some time, have been involved in electronic music, and I do a lot of music composition. And I'm very often thinking about this issue in terms of sort of the control I have over everything I do as a musician, as a performer, and the things I don't control, or things controlled by a machine or a box that maybe takes away some of my autonomy or authenticity as an artist. 
So, you know, recently I've been working with this kind of interesting device um, called the OhmSynth. And this is actually a circuit board, a prototyping board. These are called breadboards. And breadboards allow you to go in and make connections on a grid between things like computer chips here. I could put in things that we see in our typical household electronics like capacitors and resistors. Potentiometers allow us to change the value of something. Um, and actually right now you're hearing sounds from this. And as I begin to alter the movement of these potentiometers, what's kind of interesting is that I'm, I'm in a sense doing a remix. And it sort of sounds like static from a radio, but because of the parameters that I've established here by deciding what connects to what and what relationship happens between one element and the other, I am in a sense in control of what I'm doing. At the same time, I'm not fully in control because anything like this, like a circuit board, has things that essentially are what I call a black box. Anything that has a computer chip, unless I'm going in and doing chip tune, chip hacking kind of stuff, where I'm actually gonna alter um, the uh, device that I'm working with or the chip that I'm working with, presumably I don't control what's inside that tiny computer chip. Now each of these rungs, or rather terminals of the computer chip has a different operation in terms of sound, in terms of the music that I'm creating. So when I choose to patch something together and mix it with another one through one of these um, knobs or potentiometers, I am again creating something, yet there's a constraint happening at the level of the products and the, spec the specificity of what I'm using. Like if you're painting something with oil paint, right, you don't have the ability to use video unless you're doing mixed media. So you're always constrained by something that you're working in. If you write a particular style of poetry, you're constrained maybe by the expectations. If you write sonnets, um, there are limitations, right, to what you can say or how you can do a sonnet or the rules of a haiku also in poetry. So I bring this, this up and let you hear a little bit of this because I'm constantly thinking about this in terms of my own work in electronic music and video and performance. Um, for years, you know, kind of as an electronic musician, I've dealt with criticism where people say like, well, what you're doing using a drum machine or a computer like this one to determine the music that you're playing um, is too automated. And if you remember the band from late, the German band Kraftwerk from years ago, they got a lot of criticism over how much they embrace the machine and the robot in songs like Autobahn, Robot, um, Trans Euro Express, many others. Um, but I think one of the points that Kraftwerk was, was playing with, and they were so influential in terms of all sorts of music we listen to, whether electronic, rap, trance, EDM, et cetera, intelligence dance music, they really, I think, wanted to play with the idea, this ambivalence almost that they had about machines and technology and a little bit of an embrace of it and maybe also a little bit of a fear of it. And that's where I come to it in terms of my own explorations of technology, as I mentioned the work of Dennis Goulet earlier. The two-edged sword, the pitfalls, the promises, all together kind of as we consider these technological issues. So that's going to be the end of this uh, first part where we looked at maybe the threats of AI and education and what some of those threats might be. I encourage you to watch the um, additional videos here again. We'll jump into the practical stuff. We'll talk more about the conceptual stuff and hopefully get to a point where we can have a better understanding of some of this technology as it's transforming our educational worlds right this very moment as we speak. So thanks for listening. Uh, keep up the conversation and definitely reach out. We can do some workshops, have some conversations about future opportunities and challenges with AI and education going forward.